This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with the political crisis in Spain. On Saturday, Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy said he's moving to impose direct rule over Catalonia, stripping the northeastern region of its autonomy in efforts to crush Catalonia's independence movement. Following an emergency cabinet meeting on Saturday, Rajoy said he will invoke Article 155 of the Constitution, which has never been used in Spain's modern democratic history. Pending its likely approval by the Spanish Senate, Article 155 will allow Spain to fire Catalonia's elected leaders and seize control of its police forces and public broadcast channel. The move comes in response to Catalonia's independence referendum earlier this month. The Catalan regional government said 90 percent of Catalan voters chose independence in the referendum. More than 800 people were injured during the vote when Spanish police attacked them, thus police storming polling stations, firing tear gas and physically attacking the voters. This is the Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy speaking Saturday. La facultad de disolver the ability to dissolve the Catalan government, if the Senate decides to do so, the powers of the Catalan Parliament will be transferred to the president of the government. The president of the government, if the Senate decides, will have to call for elections in a maximum of six months. However, I want to do this as soon as possible to recover institutional normality, which, without doubt, is one of our goals for the future. And for that, it is important that we all work for recovering constitutional normalcy. Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy's announcement prompted outrage in Catalonia's capital, Barcelona, where nearly a half million people poured into the streets in protest. The Speaker of the Catalan Parliament called Rajoy's order a de facto coup d'état. Today, Prime Minister Rajoy, in an enormous act of political irresponsibility, has crossed all limits. He has announced the execution of a de facto coup of state, through which he intends to intervene and take control of the Catalan institutions, an attack against democracy and against the Europe of the 20th century with the goal of ending a democratically elected government. Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont called Rajoy's decision the worst attack on Catalonia since Franco's dictatorship. Puigdemont said Catalonia's parliament will meet in the coming days amid speculation he might unilaterally declare Catalan independence. For more, we're joined in Los Angeles, California, by Dominique Thomas, professor at University of California, Los Angeles, who specializes in European politics. He's chair of the Department of French and Francophone Studies. Welcome to Democracy Now!, uh, Professor Thomas. Can you start off by talking about just what happened over the weekend in Catalonia and overall in Spain? Right. Well, thank you so much for um, having me uh, on your on your show. So this all started off with uh, the prime minister um, holding a, a cabinet meeting uh, in order to discuss um, how to proceed um, with the actual non-declaration of a referendum, but nevertheless to bring, uh, in his mind, the region of Catalonia back into line. Uh, the cabinet um, supported him. He also spent time building cross-party support, going to opposition parties to make sure that when he goes to the Senate later this week, he has the mandate that he needs to essentially put the region of Catalonia into receivership. The other extraordinary thing and development was that the King of Spain, and this is a constitutional monarchy very similar to that uh, of the United Kingdom, where the king is really the figurehead uh, of this country, spoke out again, announcing that there was absolutely no way that Catalonia um, would, would at any time separate uh, from Spain. And Rajoy had just returned from the, the summit of EU leaders, where he came back with strong support from several important players in the European Union. At that particular point, then, the Catalonians um, responded and spoke out. And I think one of the most symbolic moments was when the leader uh, of Catalonia, Carlos Puigdemont, spoke in front of a European Union flag and in front of the Catalonian flag and shifted during his intervention into English, appealing to the international community and to bring attention to the fact that, as far as they are concerned, their democratic, basic democratic rights are being suspended in the region. 
Well, let's go right now to the Catalan um, leader, uh, Carlos Puigdemont, um, <clears throat> speaking this weekend about, against Spain's plan for direct rule. At one point in the speech, he switched into English. If European foundational values are at risk in Catalonia, they will also be at risk in Europe. Democratically deciding the future of a nation is not a crime. This goes against foundations that unite European citizens through their diversity. Catalonia is an ancient European nation. It's core to the European values. We do what we do because we believe in a democratic and peaceful Europe. The Europe of the Charter of Fundamental Rights that should protect each and every one of us. And I want to turn back to the Spanish Prime Minister, Mariano Rajoy, speaking Saturday. The autonomy and self-governance of Catalonia will not be suspended. It will remove the people that put that autonomous government outside of the law and the Constitution and statute. Self-governance will not end. It will be recovered for the sake of legality and for coexistence of all Catalans, and not just those who are pro-independence. So that's the Prime Minister of Spain, uh, Professor Dominic Thomas. Right. Um, so the uh, you hear them both, you know, sharing their different perspectives on this, and and this is really where it has brought this, you know, political crisis to the fore. Is that the uh, independence um, uh, leaders are absolutely um, committed to moving forward uh, with what they see as a, uh, a mandate delivered to them in the referendum of October first. Now this referendum was, of course, highly problematic because it had been declared uh, illegal and unconstitutional, and many people stayed home. Uh, bet. Carlos Puigdemont feels that the people of Catalonia have spoken and they want to proceed with this, but the uh, Spanish government insists that constitutionally um, this is just simply not possible, that these 17 states that make up um, the union of, uh, of Spain cannot separate, cannot secede from the unitary model uh, that they embraced and signed off on in the 1978 constitution. And for the time being, neither side has been willing to compromise, although both sides have claimed that they are willing to sit down and to negotiate and to have discussions about this and reach some kind of compromise. So what's stopping that? Stopping it is simply that the independence folks um, are absolutely committed to going down that path. And as far as the uh, Spanish government is concerned, uh, that is a red line. There is no uh, mechanism in place to allow them uh, to move towards uh, independence. And so this is really the struggle, is that the leaders want and feel like they have a, a mandate in parliament. They've been talking about this for a long time, that they want to have a vote on the referendum. And yet it's illegal. It's this sort of technical, technical beauty bureaucratic constitutional process that is preventing them from, from getting to this. The irony, of course, is that a few weeks ago, no statistics pointed to the fact that, in, that an independence vote would, uh, uh, would win. It seemed that there were people who were disillusioned, who had genuine grievances with the relationship of Catalonia to Spain and that were supporting the movement, but that had there been some negotiations, had some of those grievances been addressed, their support for the uh, referendum uh, would have waned. And yet, the longer that this has gone on, the more it has galvanized people in the Catalonian region, not so much because they believe in, uh, so much in uh, the independence uh, referendum, but that the violations of these basic democratic principles uh, have been very troubling and have mobilized people uh, to come out in and express support for the independence leaders against the central government. Professor Thomas, can you give us background for people who are sort of parachuting into this right now, trying to understand what this is all about. Give us a lesson in Spanish and Catalonian history. Well, it's a long history. I mean, the roots of the region uh, go back, one could argue, all the way to the, you know, to the medieval um, period, and that the history of the formation of, um, uh, of Spain uh, as, a, as, a, as a constitutional uh, entity, as a monarchy, uh, Catalonia has always been part of that. It is a region um, that has its specific language, its specific cultural roots, uh, that has been operating economically and politically uh, as part of one of the, um, the 17 states 
States, but as an independent um, state that has developed its own um, uh, cultural um, background, uh, forms of expression, and so on. And during the Franco uh, dictatorship from the late 1930s all the way through to the 1970s, um, they were persecuted. Their language uh, was banned uh, in schools and so on. And this has left a, 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 certain, a certain resentment vis-à-vis um, -vis the centralized government uh, in Madrid. And for many years now, um, the folks have been galvanized towards moving towards various measures uh, towards achieving independence. In 2006, they wanted to implement certain changes to their relationship to Madrid, and Madrid refused to ratify them. And since then, the leadership in the region has been gradually moving in the direction of holding a referendum on their future belonging to Spain. And talk more about Article 155 and why people of Catalonia are so deeply concerned at not being in vote since uh, the fascist general Franco was in power. Right. It's never been used, and it's actually, you know, vague. The one thing that's not vague, as far as Prime Minister Rajoy goes, is that he has the right, constitutionally, um, to bring regions into compliance um, if they attempt to break away from the um, from the centralized uh, centralized state. What's interesting, though, about that um, dynamic is really the optics. Is that if we on just looks at the ways in which the government has behaved leading up to the uh, the declaration of uh, Article 155, um, preventing people from going into the ballot boxes at the referendum, um, incarcerating some of the political leaders from the region, um, threatening the head of police, and then bringing the European Union in to uh, support them, is that, in terms of the optics of this, I think that people's grievances against uh, Madrid and this feeling that the Madrid central government is overreaching have been enforced by this. And this is, of course, one of the main arguments that has been used by the separatists, is that Madrid is too interfering in the region. So even those people who might not have automatically have been in favor of the referendum, find this treatment and this way in which the European Union and Prime Minister Rajoy have dealt hypocritically with some of the fundamental questions of democratic rights in the region have um, disturbed people. I mean, 900 people were injured when the Spanish police attacked voters on this referendum day. Right. And it was completely unnecessary. They declared the referendum illegal and unconstitutional. So, from that point on, they were never going to recognize it. What was the harm in allowing people uh, to go to the ballot boxes? Now, one can talk about the various pros and cons of a kind of micro-nationalist movement within Spain, but it made absolutely no sense, especially in this day of social media, uh, to go in there with that kind of force and to stop people from exercising what they fundamentally believe were their democratic principles. And this is why the situation um, has, uh, has escalated, and why, when uh, Puigdemont spoke out in English, he is well aware of the fact that the international community is going to be interested in the ways in which Spain is conducting itself right now, especially with all the attention on elections in Europe these days. So, what's going to happen next? Well, uh, later on this week, um, the prime minister um, is going to go to the Senate. Um, he's most likely going to get um, support, and they're going to go in and essentially put the region into receivership. In the meantime, the only way out for the uh, for the separatists and for the Catalonians is to have is to preempt this by going to Parliament, either declaring uh, unilateral uh, independence, which will of course escalate things um, even further, or to call regional elections themselves rather than the central government doing it, and hopefully from their point of view, return a parliament that has been re-democratically elected by the people that will give them the mandate to hold a referendum. And the outcome of that is highly unpredictable. This is also what is so problematic about the central government in Madrid insisting that they have regional elections. They already had regional elections. They already returned a democratic region um, leaders to that area. And what it looks like is that Madrid is trying to shape the outcome of the election, to hold an election and to hope that a sufficient number of people return a government that is not pro-referendum and, in so doing, will humiliate the independence leaders in the region. And this will only further divide people living in this part of the country in which families are being torn apart, businesses are flocking out of the region, and they're facing a deep economic as well as political crisis.